Porém... Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. Are we good? Amazing. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Deb Hansen Quintana and I have the honor to be the Deputy Director for Policy and Organizing at Catholics for Choice. This evening, I am so thankful that you have joined us for a conversation with Catholics for Choice President Jamie Manson and just talk about storytelling, about testimony and the importance of speaking up, but also talk about this moment and this movement. So thank you so much, Jamie, for being with us uh, tonight. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. And thanks everybody for spending your evening with us. Absolutely. Yeah, so we'll just have a conversation. We have some notes, we have some tea. And hopefully if you have any questions, feel free to add it to the Q&A box and we will get to them if we have the time at the end. But also know that you're always free to reach out to us um, and to be part of this community and to be present during this conversation as you see fit. So um, we're just delighted to, to be here. And I think that what I really appreciate um, about the opportunity to have a conversation, Jamie, is that there's so much richness in our stories, but also how interwoven they are with the movements for social change that shape our lives. Um, so yes, we're gonna be talking about your story as a Pritchard's Catholic, but also talk about like, our lives don't happen in a vacuum. So we're gonna ground in, in this moment that is so important to discuss and to sharpen our analysis of it and of this movement that we are creating together. So. Um, this is exciting. Thank you so much, Jamie. We're going to um, start mentioning that this month uh, at Catholics for Choice, we launched the I'm a Pro-Choice Catholic campaign. And since we launched this campaign, we have heard from hundreds of people who have shared their stories, reached out from elected officials that signed a statement, which is incredibly exciting, and CFC supported that work. So also theologians, but just everyday Catholics, people are speaking up about being pro-choice and being, being Catholic. We have heard this month from the pro-choice faithful. And I just want to share a quote to start us, uh, to start this conversation from Catholic feminist theologian, Mary Hunt. She puts this really beautifully when she says in a quote, love and justice are at the heart of Catholic life. The right to make reproductive decisions, including abortion, flows from love for those who are pregnant and justice for those human persons, for, for those human persons whose lives are most at stake. The, this right is an integral part of the common good, which is a core Catholic commitment, which is just perfect. Many advocates have also listed their appreciation for religious liberty as a reason, their, um, the supremacy of uh, the authority of conscience as a moral authority, and just many beliefs, right? Everyone has their story. So Jamie, can you share with us your story of how you became a Christian Catholic? Absolutely, and thanks again, everybody, for being here. Um, there are two pivotal moments, I think, that happened in my childhood mm -hmm. that was a very clear to me, I see this now, invitation to God leading me into this work. Mm -hmm. The first was my first Holy Communion on Long Island. Um, my mother was the only parent who was divorced and remarried outside the church. And um, she did not know whether to receive communion at my first Holy Communion. She spoke to the priest. He said, absolutely not. You are excommunicated. And um, she said, how can I, what can I do? And he said, well, you'd have to, you know, get an annulment, but that will cost you $3,000. Mm -hmm. This is 1984. My mother and her husband at the time were working, working poor. Mm -hmm. We didn't have $30 to the mm -hmm. church, let alone. And so I remember when I received my, my first communion, um, going up, coming back after I received the bread, turning back to see what my mother was doing and watching her as the only parent on her knees in prayer. It was the first time I saw my mother look ashamed. Mm -hmm. 
And that always has stayed with me. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward a few years later, I'm 13 years old. I met my first Holy Thursday liturgy. Mm -hmm. If those of you who are Catholic know this is a particularly dramatic liturgy, mm -hmm. all kinds of things happen that, that night that don't happen other nights, like washing of feet and mm -hmm. the Eucharist literally leaves the building at the mm -hmm. end and there's chants and there's processionals. Um, and during the processional with the Eucharist that comes at the end of that liturgy, I felt what I believe still to this day was a calling from God to dedicate my life to the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I discerned that that was a calling to the priesthood mm -hmm. in that moment. And so I spent most of my teenage years discerning this calling and telling anyone who would listen to, about this calling I had to the Catholic priesthood. Mm -hmm. You can imagine this was not the most encouraging journey I've had. Um, and, uh, but what it taught me was it helped me understand the church's position on women mm -hmm. and that somehow this God that created the universe was rendered powerless by my female body. Mm -hmm. God could not work through this body. Mm -hmm. And that is really fundamentally, you know, the teaching that undergirds all of these teachings, whether it's the ban on, on uh, same-sex marriage or the ban on trans rights or the, the ban on, on abortion rights. It's fundamentally about a vision of women because of their bodies having a very specific role in church and society. And that role is to be a mother. You know, Pope John Paul II talked about the feminine genius. This was a gift he tried to give to Catholic women when he told them they could never be priests. This is really essentially the feminine genius is our capacity to gestate a pregnancy. It's our uterus. And so that to me speaks to everything about this essentialism, um, this essentialist understanding of women, that we are called to motherhood, to be servants, to be nurturers. And that really is, is the fundamental teaching behind the position on, on everything from women's ordination to the teaching on abortion. Yeah, absolutely. And you're making a really important church, the church as it is with the all male leadership, with very male centered Christologies, with a hierarchy that is pretty much a bastion of the patriarchy, right? There is not a lot of space for the authority of women and people who can get pregnant and their leadership, but really their ability to make decisions, right? So I think that this is super important and and I think what I, what really is devastating is that this has not only material consequences for people, and we'll be talking a little bit about that, but really devastating consequences in the in the sense that a lot of folks are gonna go uncared for. And we talk about pastoral, like the current pastoral crisis that the setup of the current church is creating, right? Mm -hmm. The emergency of the church in the context of pastoral care for women and people who can get pregnant, but also for the LGBTQ plus community. And for so many folks at the margins of what the church has deemed um, authoritative. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to us a little bit about this pastoral crisis and what are some of the, of the consequences of that? Yeah, this is something I am desperate for our church, for people in the pews, our hierarchy, our priests, our nuns to really reckon with. And that is in this country, one in four abortion patients identifies as Catholic. Mm -hmm. That means that they're not just baptized Catholics, they identify as mm -hmm. Catholic. So this is still a very core part of their identity. Yeah. You know, these are people who are participating richly in the life of the church, mm -hmm. whether they're lecturing, whether they're teaching Sunday school, whether they're supporting priests, mm -hmm. which a lot of women still do in our church, wash mm -hmm. their clothes, wash their dishes, prepare their vestments. And they are having to hear a message from an all male celibate hierarchy that they are complicit in something profoundly sinful mm -hmm. when they choose abortion. And it's very spiritually violent, I'm gonna use a strong trigger word, mm -hmm. to tell these people that they're complicit in what the church calls homicide. Mm -hmm. And that is profoundly spiritually mm -hmm. violent. Mm -hmm. And you know, and so you know, if that many people are having abortions, abortion is part of the life of the church. And we have a, a leadership that will not reckon with the fact that many people in their congregations have chosen this and are having to hear 
profoundly um, damaging, harmful mm -hmm. messages. Yeah, absolutely. And just like holding that, it's it's so painful for so many folks. And as part of your role, and this is talking, just shifting a little bit to deepen more about the faithful, right? The people um, that we talk to at Catholics for Choice. Um, you go around the country talking to about for choice Catholicism, which honestly, not only grounding it theologically for a lot of communities and whoever is interested in being part of this conversation, but also holding the space for people to talk about two things we avoid for the most part, and it's abortion and faith. And we talk about abortion here and we talk about faith here, but you are holding space for folks to talk about both like access to reproductive care and their faith. And as Catholics for Choice, we say that we this is like on repeat and we just want everyone to know we do this work because of our faith and not in spite of it. So having, holding these spaces, talking to people, um, I just, I'm so curious to hear about what do people say, what do people think when you talk to these communities with these folks? And can you share with us a couple of moments that have been really formative for you as a person, for your ministry, for your leadership? Sure, if there was any upside to Roe polling a year ago, it was that Catholics suddenly got very interested in an issue that they had stealthily avoided. And this is progressive Catholics, you know, these are Catholics that are on the right side of so many issues, whether it's immigration or workers' rights or the environmental justice, mm -hmm. but this is the third rail. And that's a product of the profound stigma and taboo that our hierarchy have assigned to this mm -hmm. issue. Um, but the, the harm, the, the, you know, the, the, the punishments you can suffer for speaking about this issue are profound. Mm -hmm. um, and but people got curious and suddenly we were being called into places I never thought we would go, like Catholic universities, not the Catholic university to be clear, but <laughs> universities with a Catholic identity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, we got, we got called uh, by progressive Catholic communities mm -hmm. that hadn't touched the issue. Mm -hmm. And most powerfully for me, we got called to speak to a large community of Catholic sisters. Mm -hmm. um, and these sisters were living in a state where there was a ballot initiative. Mm -hmm. um, and this ballot initiative would have changed the state constitution to protect a, a spectrum of reproductive freedoms, not only abortion, but contraceptives and um, reproductive technologies. Uh, and these sisters who were very well educated had spent a life in service to people, genuinely did not know how to vote on this ballot. And they called me and another theologian in, uh, and we did six hours of seminars with these women. And most of them were of a certain age, and they had such stamina because they were so desperate. It was a conversation they never had before. And here it was. They had to make this, this, this moral choice, and they felt a moral obligation because they knew their church was responsible mm -hmm. for so much of what had happened with Roe. So we did the sessions all day and we, our final session was actually reading line by line the ballot language mm -hmm. and explaining line by line what it meant and why it was so expansive, uh, this, this language of this ballot. And at the end they said, Jamie, thank you. Mm -hmm. We did not know how to vote when we came in here, now we do. And they sang a prayer and bless. They raised hands over me and sang a prayer of blessing over me and sent me forth mm -hmm. to continue this work. And that was so profoundly validating because so often we feel alone at Catholics for Choice because it is such a third real issue. So to be embraced in that way was powerful. I wish these sisters had, had come public for their support mm -hmm. for the ballot, but this is a sign of how the fear still, yeah. you know, around this issue for, for Catholics. Um, but I know that they went for, they have great moral credibility in their communities, much greater moral credibility than bishops have. Mm -hmm. And they spoke to their communities and they spoke to their families and they have this authority that I know that there was, there were deep ripple effects yeah. from that conversation. Yeah. That's so beautiful. That's yeah. so beautiful and so meaningful. I think doing this work day in and day out, sometimes it's easy to miss the vocational nature of the work that we do. And earlier in this year, we went to New Mexico 
and similarly talk to many people from service providers to nuns to clinic counselors to so many folks who do want to engage this conversation, who are excited to do the work that they're doing, but also to take action. And what I think it's interesting, I talk, I have the blessing to speak to our advocates uh, in my role. And I think that we have one idea of what being an advocate means, when the reality is that we really need to make space for advocates to look and speak and do very differently, have different roles. Um, and I think about the nuns, right? And think about like how they're taking action. And I think our advocates and wanting to challenge the idea, there's just one way to be an advocate. As, I, as an example, like I am the mom of a 17 month old, a toddler. The way in which, that's a handful, that's a lot. The way in which I serve the movement as a new mom is different from the way that I served the movement five years ago, 10 years ago. And as we are in different phases of our lives, the important part of being an advocate is that we're ultimately changing the material conditions of people's lives for the better. It doesn't matter, like that is what really means um, to be an advocate, that you're taking action um, can we talk a little bit about like some folks are very loud about their advocacy and their activism. We love that. Some people do some work in the quiet, in, in behind the scenes, in different, um, there's a different roles for folks. How do we make space? Can we talk a little bit about that and how this can move us forward? Absolutely. I think so much of this work is done at kitchen tables. Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, and I think it's really important to name that there are many ways to be an advocate, as mm -hmm. you're saying. And I think one of the things we want to do at, at Catholics of Choice is welcome everybody yes. and however they want to live out that vocation, mm -hmm. because it is a vocation. It is. And so I don't think it's reasonable to expect everyone to be at the court with Catholics of mm -hmm. Choice's amazing signs mm -hmm. and being out loud and proud about mm -hmm. that. There are many, many ways. Not everyone is called to that kind of action. Um, there are other ways we can lobby. We can speak to family. Um, we can get ourselves educated, get the right information so you can share it much more broadly with people. And I think that's what's very important. I think, unfortunately, progressive movements tend to contract their circles mm -hmm. rather than widen their circles and make people feel like there's only one way to be an advocate and you have the certain orthodoxy test mm -hmm. that you have to fit or you're not a real advocate. And I don't think that's fair. Um, and I think that this moment of all moments shows us that we have to expand our circles. Yes. If we're going to win our rights back, we have to expand our circles. And we have to be fair. As I said earlier, this, this issue of abortion can get Catholics to lose, they, Catholics can lose their job for speaking about this. Mm -hmm. They can lose their ministries, which are very precious. Mm -hmm. We spoke to a Congresswoman last week in tears. She's a Eucharistic minister yeah. and is terrified of losing. She is pro-choice, she is, she espouses that, but is constantly under threat. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people like that because this all male celibate hierarchy has made it so taboo. Mm -hmm. And so we have to meet advocates in that place, wherever they are and encourage them to be a part of this movement in whatever way they see possible, mm -hmm. because we need all hands on deck yes. right now. Yes, I love that. And I try to tell our advocates that every time I get a chance that I envision a movement where there is a role and a space for everyone. And I think that another aspect of this that I'm very interested in is the fact that I taught right now. So we are facing this historical moment and not like in a historical moment in the sense that we are in a moment in history at this point in time. We marked the one year of DOS uh, last Saturday and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I envision a movement that makes space for people who are just joining us, but also continues to validate the work 
and of the people that have been doing this for generations. So building an intergenerational movement, an interdisciplinary movement, like you just said, we all have different roles and different gifts and different callings and, and making space for people's leadership um, to flourish. Um, and like I was mentioned, we just recently marked the one year anniversary, anti-anniversary of the devastating ruling that took away the constitutional right to abortion. And in this, in the year, we have experienced incredible material losses in many states. Um, and, and we had a prayer vigil at the beginning of the month and kind of listed all of those. And we grieve that, right? We have a, a, a sense of loss and an urgency because that is affecting people's lives every day. While at the same time, there are folks that have demonstrated incredible more courage to take action, to legislate, to litigate, to organize, to lobby, to advocate. So it truly has been a year, right? Um, and it's not a coincidence that CFC right now is asking people to take a stand, yeah. to be like, I am a Catholic and I am for a choice. Mm -hmm. There is a strategic reason for that. It is so important that we find a way of not being silent anymore. So can you tell us, Jamie, a little bit about the significance of this moment and help us understand how we got here and why is it important that people actually say, like, I am a purchase Catholic? Absolutely. Yeah, this is, this is a very urgent moment uh, because the five justices, Supreme mm -hmm. Court justices that struck down Roe a year ago, were all Catholic. Neil, mm -hmm. Neil Gorsuch was raised Catholic, later became Episcopal, but claims a Catholic identity. That's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact is, you know, those are Catholics, those five justices that don't reflect the convictions of the majority of Catholics in this country. And they've taken this narrative uh, away from mm -hmm. us, you know, the, 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 and the truth, which is that the majority of Catholics do support mm -hmm. abortion rights. They support it because their faith taught them social justice, conscience, and religious freedom. Mm -hmm. And you know, the fact is Catholics should have a moral obligation to speak out in this moment mm -hmm. because we have, we do have a right-wing Catholic movement, mostly of lay people, but supported greatly by our hierarchy um, that, that has just run away with this idea that you can't be Catholic and, and, be, and support abortion access. And it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact is people are suffering, people are dying because of these bans and restrictions. The very people as Catholics that we are supposed to prioritize with our gorgeous preferential option for the poor mm -hmm. that we have in our tradition are suffering the most. Mm -hmm. And so there's a moral obligation to, to stand up in this moment. The most important thing I say to people, anyone who will listen, is that the anti-choice movement is not secular. It is religious. Mm -hmm. We need people of faith to speak out. Uh, using using talking points from a faith perspective, coming at this issue as uh, a pro-choice person from a place of faith is very powerful. And that is that we have to, we need people of faith to talk back to these false religious narratives that we're confronting. It's a white supremacist Christian movement that we're fighting. That, that is where this whole modern anti-choice movement grew out of. And, and we have to, the only people, the people that can most powerfully struggle back are people of faith. So it has never been more urgent than ever to center faith voices mm -hmm. in this movement, whether it's voices from the black church or it's Catholics, Jews, everyone who's of faith and feels called to support abortion access because of their faith has got to become loud and proud about it. Yes, and I always appreciate what you say about the opposition. It's Catholic, as you just mentioned, it's religious and can speak really well to the secular movement for reproductive rights, but at times struggle to talk to people of faith, right? So that I find that fascinating because they're not practiced, right? They're responding to the people that is talking to, to them. What, what I really take seriously, Jamie, and I think that this, we, we mentioned it briefly, is the threat that people feel and we hear from folks all the time. We get emails, we hear stories, we have one-on-ones with folks that are, like I have this deeply held belief in people's rights to reproductive care. Mm -hmm. And I have been an usher at my church for 
many years and I do not want to lose that ministry. Or I've been teaching class at church for however many years. I've been a lector. I've been, I have a deep sense of belonging into this community that is under threat if I dare to speak on this. How can we hold that reality and embolden ourselves and each other and this community to speak up? This is um, one of the most important things now in the post-Dobbs world is how are we going to widen those circles? Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to meet people where they are. I understand. Mm -hmm. I, served, I served in Catholic parishes. I served in churches. I know the depth of meaning that comes from doing church ministries. And so we absolutely have to support those people who are afraid and, and meet them there and, and honor that this is a morally complex issue. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the, the pro-choice movement, the secular pro-choice movement has come up short mm -hmm. is that you're not allowed to say this is complex. Yeah. And I understand why they feel motivated because anytime they say it's complex, that gets stigmatized by the, by the other side, by the opposition. But we have to find a way to meet people in that place and create a space where they can do their moral discernment, where they can get the right information mm -hmm. and feel safe um, to, 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 to explore this issue. Mm -hmm. And again, and if they are too afraid, find other ways to be an advocate, hold on to their ministries, but find other ways to be an advocate. Not everyone has to be out loud and proud, but are you, are you moving? Like these sisters I spoke of earlier, speaking to their community, speaking to their families. Mm -hmm. This is what is so important. And so widen, this is a moment to widen our circles, not make them smaller. Yes. Um, and, and, and to really center people of faith, because those are the minds and hearts we have to transform yeah. if we're going to win our rights back. Absolutely. And I think that I tell our advocates this all the time. If you decide to speak up and really, however you take action, we are here to support that. We're here to be community. We're here to provide with education, with resources, with skills, with company, really, with good conversation and a cup of coffee or tea, whatever it is that people drink, and the opportunity to be with this is hard, and it is important that I that I do it. Actually, just remember that this past weekend, we had some advocates in Philadelphia go out and distribute our amazing, I'm a pro-choice Catholic, uh, no, a pro-choice Catholic was here, postcard. And in that interaction, because they were attending a rally that a couple of blocks away, there was the March for Life, like, her parish was going to be part of that other convocation. And I was just so moved by her. I am actually a bit afraid. And here I am with a sign. And on Saturday, I got the picture of them. I'm a pro-choice Catholic. I distributed these postcards. And that moment of reckoning with the fear but also finding that prophetic courage to do it, um, it's, it's incredible. And I'm just so grateful to be able to witness folks do that all the time. And we're, we're here for folks, like wherever they are in the journey, we're here to accompany them and to provide a sense of community and a sense of like, you're not alone, like a secret handshake for folks that, that are for choice Catholics. Um, Jimmy, you were recently in um, Alyssa Milano's podcast. Sorry, not sorry. Yes. Congratulations. The actors and activists uh, made some really great questions about your faith, about your work. And what really resonated with me, because I'm an organizer at the, den of, at the end of the day, super interested in strategy and tactics and how we win. Like, how do we win? She mentioned that, no, you mentioned that the, the opposition have a 50 year plan of misinformation. And I think those you were talking about their misinformation campaign, but this 50 year plan stuck with me because I think we also need a 50 year plan. The movement for reproductive rights and justice from a faith-based faith movement also needs a 50 year plan. 
how do we sustain that? How can we sustain a plan in the same way that the opposition that we're dealing with has been able to do over the last 50 years? Yeah, it's a tough question. And it's a hard question because we know the majority of people of faith stand with us in supporting abortion access. But again, there is that reticence mm -hmm. and that fear. And how do we engage that? Um, you know, there is a lot of disinformation put out mm -hmm. there. But back in the late 70s, a Catholic mm -hmm. doctor, Dr. Wilkie, put together the original manual for the anti-trust movement. Mm -hmm. And mess, you know, he message tests. He's the reason we say womb instead of uterus. He's the reason we say, mm -hmm. you know, mother instead of woman. All of these things, uh, baby instead of fetus. You know, they they really had it a full, fully crafted. And as a result, a lot of disinformation, manipulative images have come out. And so for me, you know, when we we knew we had an inkling that Roe was going to fall, mm -hmm. we got to work on our advocates' bible, mm -hmm. and we said we have to we have to have this one-stop shop manual for how to speak to people of faith about abortion, talking about everything from human reproduction to the white supremacist roots of this anti-choice movement, mm -hmm. to the theological reasons that we make a, a Catholic case for, for abortion access, to how to lobby, to understanding the history mm -hmm. of court cases, everything is mm -hmm. in there. And that was my way of making our own manual for the next mm -hmm. 50 years. Mm -hmm of how are we going to engage people, community by community, because it has to be that deep, that deep kind of canvassing of moving faith communities forward on this issue. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, I think to me, because there's so much fear and silence around the issue, encounter and education are the keys. And from there, you begin to do the emboldening. Yes. Yeah, I love that. And developing the trust, being in yeah. community. Yeah. There are so many, it's, it's what we do is as important as how we do it. And there's always that opportunity to, to be in community and to discern that together. Um, so folks, we will set, we'll be sending a follow-up and we'll love to send also, and we've sent it the information about the podcast. So just a plug for folks who have not been able to listen to the podcast is a great, it's a great conversation. So inviting folks to do that as well. Um, we just have been talking about the movement and I want to explicitly spend some time talking about faith-based movement, but also we're not existing in a vacuum, right? There are a lot of different communities around us that influence and we're in deep partnership with. And I always appreciate your call to precise and accessible language. So I'm just going <laughs> to be in the practice of, of ensuring that we, we understand what we mean when we say movement. Um, when, when we use the term movement, I just defining it as people and groups of people that are advocating, organizing, and working to guarantee people's access to the care that they need. So to put it simply, the movement is the networks of people and resources that here and there, sometimes they talk to each other, sometimes they don't, with a common interest in ensuring people's well-being, right? So when we say the movement, I just want to make it concrete and that be explicit about what we mean. So we've shared some amazing reflections on the moment and what is asking of us. And we know that the majority of Catholics support abortion access. So at this point in the conversation, let's turn our attention to the future and the movement that we're building, the movement that we have inherited, and the movement that we're, we're generating and creating uh, with such love. Um, where are we going and how do we get there? Yeah. No pressure. No pressure. Tell us, I, Jamie, I where are we going you. and exactly how we're going to get there? <laughs> No problem. <laughs> um, I think it's really important, you know, most of the, the reproductive rights movement mm -hmm. is traditionally white and mm -hmm. secular. Yeah. Um, and the gift that we've been given since 1994 of the, the 12 Black women who mm -hmm. created the reproductive justice framework has been an enormous gift for all communities of faith, mm -hmm. um, including um, Catholics for Choice, because our, our faith, the Catholic faith, has an amazing social justice tradition with tremendous mm -hmm. overlap with or parallels mm -hmm. with and shared strengths with the reproductive justice movement. 
And so I do think uh, what the, what the reproductive justice movement, what we're trying to do, mm -hmm. is 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 not just make this about rights, not simply about abortion, but about the totality of a person's life. Mm -hmm. That that the, the choice to have a child or not affects the entire trajectory of someone's life. Mm -hmm. And so really integrating it into and showing all the ways that pregnancy intersects with issues, mm -hmm. all the issues of social justice that Catholics care so much about, mm -hmm. whether it's workers' rights, whether it's um, violence, uh, you know, domestic violence, whether it's immigration law, mm -hmm. intersects or environmental justice, guns, everything is a reproductive yeah. justice intersection. And so I do think that's where we need to move. Um, I think what the reproductive rights the secular movement struggles to do is integrate faith well. Mm -hmm. And certainly they do not center faith voices mm -hmm. and they need to because we are fighting a religious force. The anti-choice mm -hmm. movement is religious. Mm -hmm. And so um, I also think what the, 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 the traditional reproductive rights movement has not been great about honoring the complexity of the issue mm -hmm. and meeting people where they are. You know, we have complicated relationships with with gestation, with pregnancy loss, with premature birth. Um, these are the, you know, for a lot of people, you know, they have a lot of stories around pregnancy mm -hmm. and that makes the issue complicated mm -hmm. for a lot of people coupled with all of the stigma mm -hmm. and disinformation we have. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what I'd love to see the movement do in general mm -hmm. is to find out ways to approach the issues differently, to meet people where they are, to widen these circles. Um, and, and that's what I think, that's what the, the moment calls for. And again, to center faith voices, because we all, I think, you know, you can only fight faith with faith. I really think so. Mm. And, and, and what, when we come from that place of faith, it's like kryptonite to the anti-choice movement. It really is because we can speak in their language and we can say, not in the name of my faith, will you take away people's fundamental human and mm. civil rights. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I think we can, you just said it, but we're not, we're, we can be done. We're not done yet. <laughs> um, but thank you. Yeah. That's really powerful. And we've talked a little bit about the tension. You address the tension of the, the secular and the faith. Um, what is our role, right? What is our, and we've talked a little bit about this, but is there space for um, people of faith, but also the importance of creating our community where we are holding ourselves accountable, where we are like making, being responsible for encountering other people of faith. And I think like, that's actually really hard. Like being able to get out there and say, hey, I'm a pro-choice Catholic. I think you might be one too, or I know that you're one too. That's what I talk about the secret handshake. We really need to figure that out. But being able to encounter each other and, and, and do that work of outreach, do that work of base building, um, do that work of leadership development. Um, it sounds like we have a role to play in, in this work. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm thinking when, as I'm listening to you, thinking we all have to come out to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And I, as a lesbian, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I came out in, in my first column in the National Catholic Reporter mm -hmm. in 2008. Uh, that was a different church. That was a different society. We did not have marriage. We did not have Pope Francis, mm -hmm. making it a little bit safer to talk about mm -hmm. LGBTQ issues. Um, and I like to think that by doing that, I made it safer for other people to come out and tell their story. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I often laugh. Um, I used to get uninvited from talks in Catholic spaces because I was a lesbian. They didn't realize that they invited me. Oh God, then they realized I was a lesbian. Mm -hmm. Oh, cancel. Now I get invited to speak because I'm a Catholic lesbian, but I get uninvited when they realize I'm president of Catholics for Choice. So I am very hopeful that if we continue to tell our stories, um, that we continue to get faith leaders like, like nuns or, or priests, those brave, brave people in, in, in religious life to speak out and, and say, you know, people who, who others see as a moral authority to mm -hmm. say, I support abortion access mm -hmm. because of these things that my faith taught me. 
I think, you know, and people who've had abortions can come out and tell mm-hmm. their story and say, I'm still very much participating in the life of the church. Mm-hmm. And I feel good about the decision I made to have an abortion. If we can continue to tell those stories, I have, I have faith, having seen what happened with LGBTQ issues, that we can get there mm-hmm. as a movement. But we have to, it's very important, you have to support your prophets. Mm-hmm. Prophetic role is very lonely. Yeah. You know, and and as prophets don't come out of a vacuum, they come Mm -hmm. out of deep, deep support networks. And so we have to create that support and community for one another so we can be brave. Yeah. And it's not a line. I wish it was that we're here and we'll be here tomorrow. And then in 10 years, we're going to be way forward. Right. But the progress of this work is it's slow and it's not linear. Um, So having having that support and having that sense of community is important as we deal with what is not a direct line, but more of a, just, you know, a road with (laughs) its bumps um, and setbacks. Um, Jamie, when I was in seminary, I had this amazing professor, great mentor of mine, that on our first uh, day of homiletics, which is the class where they teach you to preach, as you know, as you are also went to seminary, um, he said, and I will always remember this, preach no cheap hope. And that's just stayed with me because it's a sense of hope that it's not optimism. It is a deep practice. It is a commitment to a lifelong work. And and I, I believe that's a Christian hope, a hope that is not necessarily relying on optimism. So I'm not asking this question in the cheap hope sort of like, tell us that everything is going to be all right, Jamie. I'm truly curious, like when you think about radical hope, the hope that knows that there is a world that is possible that is within our reach and maybe not maybe I will see it maybe my child will see it um maybe someone else will see it but I believe it's possible right and and one has to to be able to wake up and do this work what gives you what gives you hope yeah um I think that you know, I, I was talking to a journalist recently and I was saying, you know, this will, they, they so often ask me, how did you get into this work? I'm like, well, mm-hmm. I felt called to be a priest, you know, when I was a teen. And, and, and I, when I look back at my own journey, you know, it started with being called to be a priest and the women's mm-hmm. ordination issue. Then later on, I realized I was a lesbian. You know, my gender expression is, mm-hmm. is queer, mm-hmm. um, you know, and now I'm fighting for abortion rights in the church. I sort of am the embodiment of all the intersections of this issue. <laughs> mm-hmm. So people say, how do you go on? Why do you keep doing this? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I say that, you know, I have good days and bad days. On my good days, I do this work because there are things about the Catholic faith that I found profoundly meaningful that no other faith has given me meaning for. Um, I believe in our sacramentality. I believe in our social justice. I believe in our rituals, our community. I want to fight for the soul of that church. And I don't want this beautiful faith to be used to take away people's rights. On my harder days, it's because the Catholic hierarchy is very powerful. Mm -hmm. And they're powerful, not just in the US, they're powerful globally. They're powerful over healthcare systems, over law, legislation, in courts. They're powerful. Mm-hmm. And, and to speak from that place of that Catholic identity, I find is very powerful. And God has always found a way for me to do this work. You know, I obviously did not have a lot of work for a lot of my life because I was, you know, taking risks and saying things people didn't want to hear. I wasn't employable in mm-hmm. Catholic spaces, but God still found a way for me to do this. And so I find hope in the fact that these doors keep opening. God still keeps making this work possible. I keep getting called forward. I get constant reaffirmation that this is what I'm meant to do. And I, my, my, my prayer every day is let me be at peace if I don't see my hopes and my dreams fulfilled in my lifetime. Mm. That I know even if I don't see what I've been working so hard for, let me still find meaning and find peace. Mm-hmm. And I do that. And that's my daily prayer. Mm-hmm. And that keeps me going. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, I I find 
deep hope in in this conversation. I find hope in our advocates who are here with us this evening, but the people that will watch this later, that are part of this community, that show up, that um, are in a different place in their advocate see advocacy journey, but still show up um, in the fullness of who they are. Um, some folks are bold and ready, and so fo some folks are sure, but but also a bit fearful. And there's just such a, a spectrum of places where where folks are. And I just find deep hope in that they still show up. Um, so thank you so much, Jamie, for this conversation. Thank you so much to everyone who is here. Um, and we do we. We can maybe take a couple of questions if we have them. Do what I mean, we're just a little music here <laughs> of waiting for the questions. Music, we'll see. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not a singing person, but are you singing? Do you no. sing? <laughs> In my dreams. I, I just wish that I was, but I'm not. Just a two. We have a peer and then we have a raised hand. You want to take one live? Um, but you can take a look. Yes, we'll we'll take at the folks that are. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, folks are. I love this. We have an organizer here who works with the Latinx community. Uh, last last year, last year. Oh my gosh, not last year. Last week. It feels like a year, but it was last week. <laughs> we had our our cafecito. Um, so we're we're excited to have an organizer here for that works with the Latinx community and is wondering what is the best way to start a conversation keeping in mind that my community is very religious and there is a lot of abortion misinformation. Thank you so much for that question. That is, that is so important. I think that, you know, part of our campaign uh, with I'm a, a Catholic for Choice is signing a pledge. Yeah. And when we developed that pledge, we were really intentional, number one, to use very accessible language. Mm -hmm. We wanted everybody to be able to understand it and to find common values. So we didn't use inside baseball, abortion yeah. movement speak. We didn't use organizer speak, mm -hmm. all due respect. You know, we didn't yeah. use theological language, yeah. mm -hmm. right? We, we, we very intentionally showed that there were just basic pro-choice values mm -hmm. that we, we think we could get as a, a starting conversation, mm -hmm. a place of agreement. Mm -hmm. So I would say, take a look at our pledge. It's yeah. on our website, catholicsofchoice.org slash pledge. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they're basic. Like, do you believe a woman has the capacity to make moral decisions for herself about her life? Mm -hmm. If you say yes, you have a pro-choice value, mm -hmm. whether you realize it or not. Yeah. So I think a lot of people have pro-choice values but because the movements are so polarized, they don't even know to name it as a pro-choice value. And I think that's a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, sometimes we make assumptions about what people think. I have been there, I've done it with so many of my people and it is not until I talk to folks that I actually don't realize what, they believe, right? So creating the, the space and being able to come with it with compassion, with some deep listening and being willing to listen. It is, it is important. Um, we also, just a plug, we have tons of resources for folks to be able to have this conversation with uh, their people in both in English and Spanish. So just a reminder to folks that if they're interested in, in those, um, they can visit our website, they can reach out at um, info at catholicsforchoice.org and we are just delighted to send them our materials. So thank you so much to folks who are asking us questions and who are participating. We're so grateful for for those uh, ways in which people are being part of this community. So um, Jamie, thank you, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your just boldness and how, um, yeah, you're um, just a presence in our community. And I'm so deeply, deeply grateful. 
I don't want to wrap up our time without uh, asking folks to stay tuned. We are going to have a um, programming in the fall, especially around the Advocates Bible that you just mentioned. And we, we have regular programming, um, but this fall we're turning in again into the Advocates Bible, making sure that we're studying, gathering together as a community. So stay tuned. We will love, especially for new folks um, that are just joining us as part of our campaign. We'll be having uh, Advocates Bible study this fall and we will make sure to send the information and continue to share the pledge, continue to ask for the postcards. Um, and just, we, we see you, we love you. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Bye everyone. Thanks, Tim.